For everybody that's uh, you know tuning in, um, I'm very blessed uh, to be joined by Commander Chris Hadfield of um, of uh, many different types of fame, whether it's having a number one selling record, uh, manning three space missions, uh, being uh, the commander of the International Space Station, um, also commanded your own trip on the space shuttle, correct? Because you've flown, you've gone up both ways, right? You you've gone up on the space shuttle and on the Soyuz. Yeah, I was part of the flight crew for two shuttle flights and then for a, a Soyuz flight. And and so, yeah, I've, I've uh, helped fly three different spaceships. Pretty amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. That, that's an understatement. So one question that I have, and maybe you get this a lot, maybe you don't get this at all, is if you were to describe the biggest difference between going up in the space shuttle versus the Soyuz, what would be that difference? Like, what's that delta? Uh, seven people versus three people. It's mm. just one, and and one vehicle can carry one vehicle can carry uh, sixty thousand pounds of cargo, and the other can't. So it's maybe the difference between um, an Uber and a semi tractor trailer. Mm. And, and the actual... both, don't get me wrong, both great spaceships, but they're just designed to do different things. You know, one's huge and carries everything, and one's just really a, a taxi for taking three people to the space station and back. But both super well proven and reliable spaceships. I'm glad to have flown them both. And when you're in the actual shuttle, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the uh, spaceship, and you're taking off and you're getting all those G's, how many G's do you hit on the way up? On, only about four. Um, Only about four, which you've yeah. you've doubled that on your fighter jet, I'm sure. Yeah, I've flown about a hundred different types of airplanes, and um, and depending on the airplane, some are strong enough to take eight G, or even more. And uh, yeah, I have. I've and in fact, I've flown centrifuges as well that have taken you all the way up to nine G. So yeah, I've I've had lots of G in my life. The <laughs> difference on a rocket ship, though, mm. is that it's sustained. You know, in a jet, you pull back on the stick and you're turning and, and you burn up all your energy. So you only pull high G for a few seconds. Mm. But in a rocket, you're pulling that G or it's lying on top of you for minute after minute after minute. So, it, you know, it's the difference between weight lifting and, um, and I guess, uh, carrying two heavy pails of water, you know, many miles. It's, it's a different thing. And is there a lot of operational controls as you're ascending, i.e. like pressing buttons or guiding a, a throttle, or is it pretty much automatic from the point you take off to the point you hit uh, orbit? Uh, you could fly the shuttle completely manual all the way from liftoff to orbit. But we'd prefer, if everything works, to have the computers do it. Um, just because, uh, you know, it's like engaging cruise control in your car, then you can concentrate on something else. But, um, but no, the, the shuttle has the capability to fly completely manually. And the Soyuz, uh, same thing, on the way back especially, you can shut off all the computers essentially and still fly the Soyuz with nothing but your wristwatch all the way back to the surface of the Earth just by hand. Oh, wow. So you, you want to have that kind of reliability um, when, when something's truly life or death. Uh, but if the computers work, let's let them do all the hard work. And are you doing uh, that kind of breathing exercise all the way up the ascent to keep the blood flow going to combat the G's? Or is that G pressure not enough to warrant those kind of like, you know, breathing exercises that have become famous, you know, in Top Gun and stuff like that? Yeah. So if you want to pull G in an airplane, um, you're sitting upright in an airplane like you do on an airliner. So you can look for enemies, right? So you can look around. So you got to sit upright. So when you pull back on the stick, it drains all the blood out of your head. But in a rocket ship, you're not looking for enemies. And so you're not sitting upright. You're actually lying on your back. Mm. And so in a, in a fighter aircraft, when you pull back on the stick, the weight of your blood as you get high G, the weight of your blood overpowers your body's ability to push the blood up. So you gray out and then you black out but it's not true in a rocket ship. You're lying on your back. So the blood doesn't drain out of your head. And so therefore it's, it's, uh, you don't have to do the, those maneuvers to squeeze the blood up to your head. Like you do in a fighter. It's different, but it's more like, imagine if you're trying to fly a really complicated machine and like five or I guess four people are lying on top of you. That's mm. more what it's like in a rocket ship. It just wow. becomes hard to breathe, hard to move your arms, hard to push your head forward, that sort of thing. But it doesn't drain the blood out of your head. 
That's that's amazing. So to sort of take a step back, because I'm really fascinated with your story, and I'm very fascinated with with you know the the kind of Renaissance man, for lack of a better term, that you've sort of evolved into um, in your career. Um, you know, especially with your writing, which I'm sure we'll get into, because I see the genre to me speaks of the stuff that I used to love when I was growing up with Jack Ryan and Tom Clancy. And I see a lot of that now with your, uh, with your, I believe in, and I apologize if I get this incorrect, your second book in the series, The Defector, that also has the main protagonist kind of growing and evolving in his kind of, you know, uh, you know, world of espionage and stuff like that. So that's another completely fascinating thing I'd love to get into. But just to take a step back, the the story that I think is commonly sort of uh, said when people speak of you is how you've known that you've wanted to do this pretty much your entire life from the age of around four, I believe it was, or or maybe seven, but in those very, very young years. And, and I just wanted to get kind of straight from you, like, what did that really mean? Like, did you, you know, see um, Star Trek and say, okay, I want to go up there in space? Or did you say, okay, because you're a very pragmatic man. Okay, I want to become a pilot. That was goal number one. And then after you did that, you hit goal number two. Like, how did that evolution really take shape in your young years? Mark, it started with comic books. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, as a kid, who doesn't like comic books? They're so <laughs> visual and compelling. And, and the, you know, the heroes are so muscular and powerful and rocketing around with jetpacks and things. And then when I got a little, you know, more nuanced, started reading more science fiction. and and then, as you say, Star Trek on television and 2001, A Space Odyssey in the movie theaters. Mm -hmm. And and all of that was, it was just an expansion of my imagination. You know, I was growing up on a farm where life's pretty practical, but, but my head was full of all of these amazing science fiction dreams and possibilities and exploration. And But none of it was real. What mm -hmm. really changed it was... Uh, people flying in space for real, you know, with mm. uh, Yuri Gagarin and then Al Shepard and the Mercury program, Gemini program, and then the Apollo program when people were going to the moon. And a lot of people find uh, what they were entranced with or amazed by or excited about when they were 10 years old. That's kind of who they are. You know, it mm. kind of set their pattern for life. And when I was turning 10 years old, that's when Neil and Buzz stepped onto the surface of the moon that summer. And for me, I just thought, holy cow, this is comic books and Star Trek, but it's it could it could actually do this. It's like right. if uh, if X Men was real, you know, if that was a career choice, you know, it's if it wasn't just pretend. And so for me, I just thought, if that is something that that people can do, I want to do that. How do you how do you do that? And so for me, it just gave me uh, a distant goal. Mm. Uh, a set of long-term dreamlike objectives, but obviously attainable because people were doing them. And that was super helpful in then choosing what I was going to do next. Like, what should I do this weekend? If I want to walk on the moon, what should I do this weekend? What should I read about? What, sh what, you know, what should I join the, the Cub Scouts? Should I join the air mm -hmm. cadets? Should I learn to swim? Should I learn to scuba dive? Should I learn to fly? You know, if you don't have, long-term, barely attainable goals in your life, then how do you choose what to do next? Right. So to me, it's it's really simple. And uh, and it and it's not just flying in space. It applies to every single thing I do in my whole life. What are the what are the long-term, barely attainable things that I would love to have as part of my life? And how can I start doing stuff today that moves my life in that direction? And what was that first cognitive choice that you remember making that was like, okay, this is a serious career path decision that put you on this thing? Because everybody says it might be the most popular answer of all time in the sort of primary school when the teacher says, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be an astronaut is probably the number one answer of all time, right? Yeah. And I, don't, <laughs> I don't even think that's a fair question. I get asked, you know, I... I I speak to a lot of businesses and help run businesses and things, but I've worked with a lot of kids and spoken in a lot of schools as well. I don't think you should ask them that question. I think a better question is, what do you want to change in the world or what pisses you mm -hmm. off? What do Ooh, you I think like is wrong in the world? 
And it's because that's where their heart is. You know, what do I, what do I really want to change? And for me as a kid, I think we should be exploring the rest of the universe. How come we're not doing that yet? Mm. We've now we've invented rockets. Let's get at this. Let's do it. And so um, for me, I think, you know, there were lots of little subtle, what books I was going to read. You know, I looked at the early astronauts and I thought, okay, they're all fit. All right. Then I'm going to keep myself fit. I, I be careful what I eat, get a little exercise every day, simple check mm. and then move on. And then it's like, okay, they all um, do spacewalks and they train underwater. So they're all scuba divers. Okay. I got to learn to scuba dive, but maybe most importantly, they fly in space. I, I got to learn how to fly. They're all pilots. They know how to fly. Mm. And I didn't have any money, but there are programs around, depending what country you're in. In the United States, there's a civil air patrol and lots of scholarship programs, Canada thing called air cadets. So I thought, and at 13 years old, I joined the air cadets and they taught me to fly. I got my glider pilot's license when I was 15 and my wow. powered license with engines when I was 16. And it was all fun, you know, scuba diving and, and you know, all the rest of it, flying airplanes. I, I could fly an airplane before I was legal to drive a car. You know, yeah, that's that, that's crazy. fascinating. Crazy. I actually, anyway, so to, to me, that's the pattern that matters. So not to jump around, but this is, you know, when I've gotten a chance to speak to so many great folks on this show and, and um, I'm particularly interested in the pilots. And, you know, I, I had one of my favorite conversations was, was with the late, great uh, Brian Schull. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was a SR 71 Blackbird pilot. Cool. Um, who just recently passed away. And his story is, you know, absolutely fascinating. And and I myself, so I'm a scuba diver and I became a scuba diver uh, licensed uh, paddy when I was 12 years old, right? So I've been doing that for a long time. I'm in the Florida Keys. You know, I've been diving for a long time and I can relate to a lot of the things you say about panic through the lens of scuba diving, right? Because when you're 80 feet underwater, you got to solve everything down there. Um but I'm also uh, learning how to be a pilot, and I've and I've logged in about thirty hours on on a small you cool. know aircraft. And this is one thing that I've been you know sorry for the ramble, but I've been really excited to ask you specifically about this. Is I've reached the point where I've gotten about thirty hours, and my teachers are like, "Oh, Mark, you're doing great. You you really know how to do this thing. It's time for you to take your first solo flight." And I have this kind of weird panic that I've, you know, justified in my brain as like, oh, the airplane, the Cessna that we fly is like a little lawnmower. It's, it's unsafe. I want to do it on a nicer plane. So I keep making as many excuses for myself as possible to not take the solo flight. And every time I go to the Academy and they're like, Hey Mark, you know, you're ready to do the solo flight today. And I'm like, no, no, it's okay. You can come with me. I just want to do some more thing. And they're like, you've done this a hundred times. It's time for the solo flight, you know? So I just kind of wanted to see what your perspective is on that, because so much of what I think is valuable about what you're imparting onto people is how to deal with these kind of mental blocks. Sure. Um, you're naturally afraid of it because it's something you haven't done yet and you're not sure of all of your skills. Um, that's really common for every pilot. And I, the way a lot of instructors do it, the last thing you want to do is ask the student because they're never going to be ready. Uh, mm -hmm. It's up to the instructor. That's why you're the instructor. You have to have recognized and watch the student uh, enough times to know from your own experience that, yeah, they've got all the skills, they've got the decision-making capability, mm -hmm. and uh, and now's the time for them to go solo. Otherwise, you're just going to keep prolonging this, this weird frozen moment in time <laughs> when nobody's getting any better at anything. So uh, what I, I soloed after eight hours and what oh, wow. my instructor just, but that was pretty normal because I was doing it every day. Um, my instructor just said, okay, uh, that was a really good landing. And um, I want you to do it again, exactly like that by yourself. And he got out of the airplane. He just on the runway. He just said, yeah. I'm out. <laughs> got out so I'll, I'll walk back to the hangar, have a good flight and just taxi back in when you're done. And so it's like, take a big gulp, but um, you're not going to be able to fly solo until you go fly solo. And, and then the rest mm. of your life will be flying solo. It's sort of like when you learn to ride a bike, super wobbly and dangerous and you fall over. But someone did all that work with you till eventually they turned you loose. And if they're clever about it, they didn't even let you know they let go of the back of your seat. They, they did the same sort of thing. And so 
Um, you just need to do it. Get a day when the wind, winds are okay, the weather's decent. Do a few patterns with your instructor until you got your skills back sharp and you remember. And then tell them, hey, get out. I'm going to do this next one by myself. Wow. And I just got chills because I've never thought about that before. That's all there is to it. <laughs> so I know it's like comparing apples and oranges, but as a young um, you know, uh, man uh, getting your uh, pilot's license, doing your first solo flight at such a young age, was, was there an analog feeling that you got between that moment and when you strapped in? to that, you know, gigantic rocket ready to leave, um, you know, the earth? Oh, yeah. Uh, flying a machine is flying a machine. I, I was a combat fighter pilot. Uh, I've flown about 100 types, as I said, big airplanes, little tiny one seat airplanes and gliders. Um, and so something I learned a long time ago is a flying machine is just a flying machine. You got to figure out how to turn it on and you got to figure out all the ways it's going to try and kill you. And, and that's your job. <laughs> And and so a rocket ship's just uh, the same thing, you know, but exaggerated on steroids. So I spent, you know, I got uh, I went to four different universities and I not only was a combat fighter pilot, I went to test pilot school, which is mm -hmm. like a Ph.D. in flying. And then I worked as a Navy test pilot for a little over three years at uh, in over the Chesapeake in Maryland and, you know, putting F-18s out of control and and all, all kinds of stuff and all of that was preparation for the skill set that I needed to be able to be trusted to fly a rocket ship. They're dangerous and they're complicated and, and stuff goes wrong in a hurry and the consequences are huge. And sure. so, so you want to have that background, but the beauty of having the background is when you get into the space shuttle, I was on Atlantis on my first flight. I was sitting, I wasn't the commander naturally. It was my first flight, but I, I was on the flight deck. Um, I was excited. I was super keenly aware, hyper aware of what was going on, super focused, but I wasn't afraid. Mm -hmm. the, like there, I didn't need to be afraid. I had a lot more going for myself than fear at that mm -hmm. point. And it was based on an enormous pyramid of uh, preparation and experience so that I could get in that cockpit and be confident with all the things that I needed to be able to do. And, um, and I apologize for not knowing this, but is this, um, did you serve in the American military or the Canadian military as Both. a liaison of some kind or? Both. I, I, I'm, uh, I was a colonel in the Royal Canadian Air Force. I went to test pilot school out at Edwards, same place where Chuck Yeager broke the speed of sound up in mm -hmm. the high desert, the Mojave Desert with the U.S. Air Force as a test pilot. And then I did an exchange tour with the U.S. Navy as a uh, an F-18 and A-7 test pilot. And when you're a test pilot, you end up flying a bunch of different airplanes as well. But uh, yeah, and then I flew with NASA for uh, whatever, 21 years with NASA. Wow. And now I'm a private pilot in Florida, in fact. So uh, once you get solo, we can maybe go flying together. Oh God, that would be an honor. Um, so you flew the F-18, right? So the F-18, for those who don't know, made famous recently. Uh, by the new Top Gun movie. That's like the F-18 Super Hornet, which I think is like a slightly newer version of it. But you, you've you been flying this thing, what, for 20 years? You you got into one of those bad boys? Yeah, I got into the F-18s when they were brand new. The I, mm. I flew several of them that had like six hours on the airframe, you know, wow. still had that new airplane smell. And, um, and then when I was a test pilot with the Navy, we did a lot of the developmental work that led to the later models, like the Super Hornet models. You know, you had to, someone's got to test all that stuff, new engines, mm. uh, new uh, handling characteristics, all that stuff. So, so I, I, obviously I was just part of a huge team of people, but I, I helped do some of that work as well. But yeah, I've flown a bunch of different fighters, but the Hornet, the F-18, uh, wonderful, capable, amazing machine to fly. And I think the second, the first Top Top Gun movie was just, you know, a cartoon. The second Top Gun movie was excellent. It really mm. was visceral. That's what it feels like to, to fly a fighter. And Tom Cruise grew up a lot. You know, he sure. became a pilot, has his own airplanes, and, and oh, yeah. uh, he made all his actors sit in the actual cockpit yeah, while yeah. they were filming those, you know, in the back seat, but still. So I think that level of realism it really brought it home. That's that's what it looks and feels like to fly a fighter. Yeah, he, he's got his own, which is my favorite airplane of all time. 
I have a really nice simulator of it. He's got his own P-51 Mustang, like yeah. a legit, authentic P-51 Mustang with the Rolls-Royce engine. And everything. Yeah, I, I've flown a P-51, and I occasionally fly a Spitfire. Uh, oh, wow, you've flown a P-51? Has the same big engine, yeah. And um, and so, uh, yeah, and that's not, the P-51 is not an easy airplane to fly. It's got a, mm -hmm. a weird airfoil design on the wing that it'll try and kill you. It's got some bad characteristics. So, so yeah, he knows how to fly a P-51. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> and now I think he also has like a Honda a jet, like a, like one of those little tiny Honda jets. I mean, yeah. he's got all the toys. He's got all the toys. That's, but that's what, just a way to get places, yeah. So, so one question, because sort of taking it back to that very meaningful thing you said at the start, that you had this kind of high concept, long-term vision of exploring the universe, as you said, and you're doing all these amazing things, test pilot, F-18, really becoming a true, you know, one in a million in terms of your field, because it's not, you know, there's not hundreds of thousands of F-18 pilots, right? It's a very selective uh, few people. It's like playing professional sports. Is this thing in the back of your head, this ambition of going out into space, still motivating you? Are you trying to find what's the next thing? that gets you closer to that goal? Or does somebody just call you and say, Chris, you're a badass, bro. It's time for you to go uh, to space. Yeah, that's not how it works. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I always, since I made the decision uh, when I was turning 10, have had the long-term goal of, uh, of flying in space. I thought, okay, that it, it, it probably won't happen. The odds are terrible, but uh, without an objective, you're, you're never going to get there. It's sure not going to happen if I don't try. And so uh, all of the decisions I made were in at least uh, in recognition of that idea, if not in direct support of that idea, but also recognizing that it's probably never going to happen. And that's okay mm -hmm. too. So let's choose things along the way that that appeal to me, that are interesting, that bring out the best in me. You know, to be, an, I'm a mechanical engineer. I have a master's degree in uh, aerospace systems. It's like, well, that's an interesting job. And and I, I, I like all of the stuff that goes along with that. And I'm a fighter pilot. Well, that's an interesting job, but you can't do that job after about 40. And I'm a test pilot. Now, to me, that's everything. That's the engineering and the, and the, a complex nature of flying That's and the high the right demand. Stuff. And so, yeah. And so to me, that was, and I'd love to do that for the rest of my life. And really there was only one job that I thought would be a real step up from being a top level uh, fighter test pilot. And that would be if someone would select me to be an astronaut. And then the space agency had a big national competition um, when, uh, when I was being, when I was a test pilot, sort of at the peak, I, I just won like, U.S. Navy Test Pilot of the Year, and mm -hmm. uh, and for a project I'd done with a bunch of people, and so uh, I applied with like five thousand three hundred and thirty other people, and they chose four of us, and three of us eventually flew in space. So, so yeah, it was, and to me that was just like I can't believe it. You know, when you get that phone call, Mark, you're in your kitchen, and the phone rings, and it's like the head of the space agency saying, "Hey, do you still want to be an astronaut?" You know, it's just an unbelievable watershed. You know, everything else was like moving up the hill towards this point. And now you're looking over the other side of something you thought you'd never get to. Pretty amazing moment. But you also realize, okay, this is just the start of, of another, you know, 20 or 30 year commitment of what I'm going to be doing. But how cool is it? You know, it's got all the fun stuff in it. And I still feel the same way about everything that I'm challenging myself with and and uh, and producing these days. And um, from when you got that phone call to when you were actually strapped to the rocket around how much time did you actually prepare your mind and your body for this and your, well, you know. So I'd been preparing my mind and my body since I was nine, but realistically. So 26 years from the time I decided to be an astronaut till the, the engine, well, till the engine shut off when we were in orbit. Um, but from the day that I was hired as an astronaut until I flew in space, it was about uh, three and a half years. And mm -hmm. what you do in those three and a half years is you take everything you've learned so far, all of that huge pyramid of capability and knowledge underneath yourself, and now you add all the specifics of what an astronaut needs, orbital mechanics and control theory and the specifics of the machines and all of the emergency procedures and you know all of the, the specifics of that. 
and then you practice them over and over and over again. And mostly you practice for things to go wrong endlessly, endlessly. So that when you're in the rocket, uh, I was in space shuttle Atlantis on my first launch. Um, you're, you're ready. You know, mm -hmm. you are ready. You've, you've done all the work. And now, even though it's a dangerous thing, you don't have to be afraid because there's a difference between danger and fear. They're not the mm -hmm. same thing. And sure. You, sure, it's dangerous, but if you're ready, then you don't have to be afraid. You know, you know what you're doing. And so, uh, so that, that exhilarating moment came uh, three and a half years after I got that phone call. So when, when in preparation for this, I asked my community for some questions and the two questions that I kept getting, um, I'm going to ask you them now so I don't forget and they don't get mad at me. So um, how, how many hours would you estimate you've, you've flown, been in space, like probably thousands of hours, right? It was safe well, to say. I, flying airplanes about 5,000 hours and, uh, and then in space, uh, 166 days. Okay, so an immense um, sample size. Yeah, Have you yeah. ever seen anything out there that you can't explain? I can hardly explain anything, but you mean okay, UFOs. Okay, that's you the wrong UFOs, question. Right? That's the wrong question. Have yeah, you ever seen anything out there that you could potentially explain as a quote-unquote UFO? No, no astronaut ever has. And in all of my depth of experience, flying... You know, my dad's an airline pilot. Both my brothers are airline pilots. My nephew's an airline pilot. You know, hundreds of thousands of hours in airplanes. And all my fighter community, and I flew with the Canadian Air Force, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy. Uh, I did a lot of flying with the National Guard. And then I flew 21 years with NASA. And I was president of the Space Explorers uh, <laughs> Association. So I know all the astronauts from all the countries. And no one has ever seen anything that is a UFO. We're looking like crazy. You know, we're, we're driving around on Mars. We built the Hubble telescope. We built the James Webb telescope is looking at the atmosphere of planets that are orbiting other stars. Mm. You know, we're, we're looking, I'm sure there's life in the universe. It'd be very arrogant to think we're the course, only life that exists out of an unlimited number of planets, essentially. But it's also super arrogant to think Hey, some pilot, some whistleblower, whatever that means, <laughs> some pilot saw something in his HUD and they showed it to me on YouTube. And I saw this little thing and I have no idea what it is. So it has to be intelligent life from another solar system. That doesn't make any sense. You know, what we need is evidence, actual, sure. true evidence. But I'm just as excited about it as everybody else. I'm sure there's life out in the universe. Of it's one of the main things that are we alone or not you know and and life's been on earth for four well three and a half of the four and a half billion years of life so life is tough and tenacious mm. on earth but intelligent life at our level with civilization this might be the first time in three and a half billion years of life that we got this far mm. and so to try and find other intelligent life while we're at this moment it's super important and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons we got to be pushing the edge of exploration and settlement, getting our eggs out of one basket, trying to trying to not squander this amazing development of human intelligence. To me, it all just sort of all fits together. And I'm looking for UFOs just I, I, every day on the spaceship. Lots of people do. And, you know, people will say, oh, but I heard an interview with someone who said that they saw. Yeah, well. Just listen to the huge preponderance of the vast everybody who's done all these things, and none of them are talking about it. Don't don't choose the one little thing that you thought you heard and assume that that is the reality. It, it, you know, it, as soon as we find life anywhere but Earth, we'll be trumpeting it to the whole universe. I mean, sure. think how big NASA's budget'd be. You know, it's just it doesn't even pass common sense tests. So, you know, we're gonna find out the answer. Maybe. We'll find a fossil on Mars. That would be cool. But, yeah. uh, you know, that's why we're going to uh, Europa fairly soon. It's got more water than Earth. Yeah. One of the moons out there. And and so, yeah, we're, we're looking to try and answer that question. But And I wish I could say, yeah, but the reality is not yet. Well, supposedly there's tardigrades living on the hull of the ISS. You know, they say that they have found actual life forms that are living on the outside. Well, lichen, uh, you know, that that mossy stuff that grows on rock that looks like it's barely surviving, it has survived for months in space. Oh, wow. You know, it's, a, it's, it's primitive life, but it's life. 
you know, and, and we've drilled miles down into the crust of the earth, way down deep in the rock. And you go miles underground and there's life down there, miles underground. There's yeah. life that doesn't need oxygen, you know, that uses weird other gases. Life is tough and tenacious and we might not mm -hmm. even recognize life on Mars when we see it or detect it, you know, but um, that's because we're new at this. We're figuring it all out. And, and to me, it's the fundamental excitement of space exploration is to answer that question. Are sure. we alone? And, uh, and can we discover other life, you know, single cell, but maybe intelligent life? To me, that, that's a really interesting new possibility with space exploration. The, um, the, just for context, because people always, like, you know, I think imagine all oh, the ISS is, this international space station, people are walking around, hanging out at the cafe. Like in terms of actually seeing outside, how big are the windows and how many windows actually are there? Space stations like uh, seven city buses bolted together with no gravity. Mm. So it's a pretty amazing place. It's like you're in this big metal cave. It feels like a hospital inside sort of because there's, it's super clean and very, mm sterile and, and uh, all full of equipment and the humming of machinery. Is there a lab. smell? Is there like a, like a distinct Actually, smell? No, it's, it's got really good air purification systems. Mm. So it's, it's uh, I never smelled. And also all of your food is, is in packets. You know, mm. you don't cook anything open. So there's not even, if you make coffee, you drink it out of a bag. So you don't even get the smell of coffee, you know? So it's, mm. it's different. Um, windows, we have, I forget, like 16 windows on the spaceship. Most of them are little, but there's a couple big ones. Um, one, uh, you know, about as wide across as my hands, you know, maybe a foot and a half. And then one of them that is over a yard across. And it doesn't just look straight down, but it bulges out and it's got little windows around the side. So oh, you wow. can, we, that's a cupola. It's like an architectural feature. And you can float down into the cupola. And you can look forwards where you're going, you can look back where you've been, and you can look straight down at the earth. And it's pretty good plastic. So when you take the pictures, you don't get much distortion. So yeah, you every you don't get a lot of free time when you're a professional astronaut, but every free second you get, you, you float to the cupola and, and look at the world because it's just so mesmerizingly, gorgeously, generously beautiful and surprising. Yeah, that's awesome. So the second question that I got which is, you know, everybody says that when you do space travel, just like, you know, even on my little Cessna, you know, you have to account for like basically every pound of weight, every micron, like you have to really account for everything that's going up because it's all part of the equation. Um, how did you get the guitar up there? Like, did they say, oh, I, okay, you have a budget to bring I, personal goods and your budget was like, no, I'm bringing I, my, I, my I didn't market. put the, I didn't put the guitar up there. Oh, you didn't put the guitar the, up there. The guitar was put there in the summer of 2001, so 22 years, 23 years ago almost, by the NASA psychiatrists and the psychological support team. Oh, wow. Because so they recognized that, I mean, you can't go through a day. I mean, look at the wall behind you. You can't go through a day on Earth without music. There's mm. always music playing in our heads. You know, we have found musical instruments from 40,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well people made little flutes out of out little of ocarinas. Leg bones yeah, little tiny well, actually, bird ocarinas. leg bones of birds, even before that, sure. where they hollowed them out and you blow in the end like a, like a clarinet or something. And um, so music predates all written history, all civilization. Music is fundamental to being human. So you need it. You know, it, mm. art helps explain all the complexity to you. And so, so um, the, uh, NASA psychiatrists recognize, hey, we got to give people a chance to to express themselves up there. And so, in in July, on I think it was STS-104, Atlantis, they um, because the shuttle could carry a lot of stuff, they sure. they got an undersized guitar. It's it's uh, it'll play normal. It's built by Larry Vay, mm -hmm. uh, nice company. They went to the local guitar shop in Webster, Texas, just like what's it called? The guitar store. Right. And they went in and they just talked to the long haired tech there and said, Hey, we want uh, two guitars, uh, small acoustic um, and uh, good guitars. And he sold them two Larry V parlor guitars and one they keep in bond on earth. So they know what they bought. And the other one got sent up to the space station. And so when I got there in 2012, you know, I'd already been there for 11 years and, oh, wow. and it's, it's played pretty much every day, you know, it's upper time almost always one of the astronauts everybody plays a little bit of guitar and uh, but i just thought 
shoot, there's a guitar up there. Um, I've been a musician my whole life. I've fronted bands, you know, for 40 years. Uh, shoot, I'm going to not just play it, but I'm going to write some music and see if I can figure out a good way to record some music when I'm supposed to be mm. asleep because they don't give you any time to do that. But, you know, they mm. budget you seven and a half hours sleep a night. So I'd steal the first hour of my sleep and uh, and play that guitar and write music. And I just used GarageBand on an iPad uh, just so I could get a click track and, uh, and you know, sure. some mixing. And I just float with nice Sennheiser mics on board and I would just float a Sennheiser mic in front of me and lay down the guitar track and then do the vocals on top of that. And I wrote and recorded a whole album up there that's done great. And uh, yeah, it's done very and, well. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, I, I did a, a recorded, wrote and recorded a song with a band called the Bare Naked Ladies. Sure. That we sang live with 700,000 people simultaneously, a song called Is Somebody Singing? And then I did a cover of a Bowie tune that Bowie loved. And gosh, hundreds of millions of people have seen that. So, so yeah, music. It, just because you're on a spaceship doesn't mean you, you can leave all your life behind. And uh, I think it's really great that that guitar is still up there now, of course, going around the world, uh, you know, more times than anything has ever gone around the world. What, was and, that Larrabee? The, first of all, you blew my mind with something. And I just kept thinking about that movie, Apollo 13, that they actually bought two of them just in case something hit the fan. They knew exactly what they had like yeah. down you know so first of all that's such a cool concept you know like yeah. like you really like sort of transcended the gap for me there a little bit um yeah it's just smart did, did you ever have any of your pals up there like maybe your you know your sort of russian comrades or the chinese folks or the people from other countries like oh shit here's chris again he's playing the guitar it's three in the morning oh no you wouldn't <laughs> do that um i mean um you got a huge respect for everybody else and everybody else's needs come ahead of your own on a Because you guys are all pretty t packed in together, right? The living quarters, well, I'm assuming. It's the size of seven city buses. It's pretty big. Yeah, which to me sounds pretty big, to be honest with you. There's only six people. Right. You know? so, so you can spend the better part of a day and not see anybody else all day, you know, because you're working in one of the laboratories way down at the end and everyone's working on their stuff. And maybe you'll see them at lunch or supper, but... Um, but no, you don't do anything. Like if you're doing a phone call or a video call with home or filming something for all the, you know, you got to talk to whatever the president or something, you don't want to interfere <laughs> with other people. So, um, so you, you set that up someplace where it doesn't bug people. And then to record music, you need a quiet place. And sure. space station has all the fans and pumps running all the time. So it's noisy. It's like, like the back of a bus, you know, where you're near the engine. Uh, so the only the quietest place was in my little sleep pod, um, and I would turn the fan down to where it was just moving enough air to keep me from suffocating, and I and then I would record in there and I'd hang a little sign on the door just saying, "Hey, I'm recording," and um, and and then didn't bug anybody else. But you know, when we had a celebration, like if it was a birthday or a one of the holiday, you know. Uh, Easter or Christmas or New Year's or something, then, um, the, you know, lots of people, Roman Romanenka, he's a guitar player, he used to play in a rock and roll band. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Marshburn is a classical guitar player. So we had three guitar players on my crew. And so we'd pass the guitar around and play songs from when we were kids and, you know, play play Beatles and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a nice, just like anywhere, it's, it's a really nice way for people to, express themselves and relax and share some of their own memories. And, and that's what the guitar is mostly for the recording I did without bugging anybody else. That's awesome. Um, was that the first instrument in outer space, that particular Larravee? Just oh, gosh, no, uh, back on Gemini, you know, before Apollo, mm -hmm. uh, some of the guys flew close to Christmas and they brought along, um, a harmonica and some little, those, like those little reindeer bells. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, little, so little they did, percussion. they did some, they did a version of Jingle Bells back on Gemini. Right. You know, so, no, and, and the the Russians, the Soviets, they've had guitars on their space stations since the 1970s. Oh, wow. And, uh, and there's been various instruments. You know, the shuttle was a big truck of a machine that could mm. carry a lot of stuff. So uh, there have been various things brought up and down. And there's a little collection of musical instruments up there. There's a ukulele. There's an old battery-powered keyboard. There's... Uh, what else is up there? There's a bell, there's a harmonica, <laughs> so you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. All right. So 
just a few more questions because I'm running out of time. I want to be respectful of your time. And I still want to ask you, dig into the book stuff a little bit. Um, one thing that's always kind of, uh, you know, made me sort of wonder and inspired my imagination is, do you have to get used to sleeping in zero G or is that something that you kind of train for? So when you get there, like, how do you simulate that sort of those six to eight hours of not having consciousness? M Mark, imagine right now, if you could just, where you're sitting, if you could relax every muscle in your body, you didn't have mm -hmm. to fight gravity by sitting up or hold your head up or anything. Right. Almost like you're in the Florida Keys. Just ease yourself into a pool or, or you know, into the, the waters there. Ease yourself into the water and then let about half the air out of your lungs so that you're not sinking and you're mm -hmm. not floating. You're just sort of suspended in the in the water and, and then relax every muscle in your body. Like until... Nothing, you, what happens is your arms will bend in front of you a little bit, your knees will bend, your waist will bend, your head will tip forward. That's the natural neutral state of all your muscles. Wow. And it is the most comfortable thing you can imagine because oh, wow. you don't need a mattress, you don't need a pillow, you don't have to roll over, your shoulder doesn't get right, sore. Right, right, because there's and, no weight and, on your body. Oh, it's so, it's just great. It's just, I think, uh, uh, you know, as soon as we get the cost of launch down cheap enough, that's one of the things people are going to like the best in the, you know, space spa. Once we figure out how to do all that, that just how wonderful it is to be able to sleep in perfect relaxation. It's, it's, it's a great way to sleep. Oh, that's awesome. So, okay. So, um, your, your, um, you know, series, um, the defector, um, the first one was how to be, a fighter pilot. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm forget. Uh, maybe I'm getting the name wrong. Uh, the 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 first book was called. So so I've written uh, five books. The okay. first three are nonfiction, but the last two are fiction. And mm. it's it's uh, the Apollo Murders series. And the one you just mentioned is the second book. So I wrote the Apollo Murders, which is thriller fiction. Mm. And, and by the way, um, it's being made into an eight part television series. Sylvester Stallone's production company, which oh, wow. Congratulations. He, calls, uh, he calls Balboa Productions, naturally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's huge. Um, they're, they're working with a British company to, to make the Apollo murders into a, uh, a television series. And the next book in that series is The Defector. And, uh, and I'm writing the third book. And I was writing it this morning, in fact, the third book in the series. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's kind of everything that I've learned but then turned into what could have maybe just happened in the mm. space program. And I set the, um, in the early seventies at the end of the Apollo era. Yeah. Yeah. Which is an interesting choice. I wanted yeah, to ask you about that. Start of the shuttle era, um, the height of the cold war, when Nixon's presidency was coming apart at the seams with Watergate, when the Vietnam war was ending, when uh, women's rights were getting. Um, These are your formative years, right? Rock. Personally, like you were a teenager. Yeah, and I was a teenager then. So for me, it's a uh, a really tumultuous time in space history and in cultural history. So it gave me a lot of possibilities for uh, for things that I could write into. Because my, my books are alternative history fiction. Sure. Most of the stuff in the books, like, I don't know, 95% of the... Here, I've got one of the books here. Yeah, because the factor of the deals stuff. with technology that didn't really exist, right? Like, like the MIG. <laughs> but the but almost everything in this book this fiction book is real, real characters, real people, real historical events, all those things. And then I just weave my plot in amongst all of that stuff that really happened. And I think it makes it more compelling. It's not just, you know, fantasy, but it's, hey, man, this is so close to reality. You can't even tell what really happened and what didn't. And yeah, yeah the, the Paula Murders is international bestseller and in a bunch of languages now. And we've just released this one recently and it's doing great. So, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the yeah, fact I'm familiar with, and I appreciate you for sending me a copy. I've been reading that one. I'm not as familiar with the Apollo murders without any spoilers. Kind of what's the overview of the plot for that one? The summary a little bit. Uh, well, you can tell from the it title. It's, it's, it's a Apollo, great name. Yeah, yeah. It's Apollo, and at least two people are killed. You know, <laughs> right, it's right, right. Um, is this a historical and, like reality, or this is completely? No, it's ninety-five percent real. Mm. But my my plot is is uh, you know woven in. So uh, essentially, the story of Apollo, the Apollo murders, is um, what if Apollo eighteen 
which got canceled by Nixon, what if uh, it had been uh, funded by the Air Force? Like the shuttle was originally really heavily funded by the Air Force to have military purposes. And uh, so what if that had happened and they'd had different objectives for a flight? And so that's uh, kind of the core, but then it doesn't go as planned. And, the, and, and there's a secret Soviet spy space station called Diamond that was real at the time. Mm. And um, and what happens with its crew, and then what happens on the surface of the moon, and then how it, and what they discover. Um, so, yeah, it um, it's done great. And and then the defector is same lead characters, a guy mm -hmm. named Kaz Zemeckis, a former test pilot. Um, yeah, yeah, he's the Kennedy. lead in the defector. He's the one that, yeah. that that's in Israel when. When That's he right. Sees the the whole stuff go down. Yeah, when he and when he sees uh, a MiG twenty five defect, and mm -hmm. uh, and then what does the he United States back States, to the U.S. Which yeah. like sorry to interrupt, but in my head it's just like I can totally see that story. Like like you yeah, know, and, was, and what's cool is when, when all of in reality all of the Soviet airplanes that the United States got their hands on, whether you know they bought them sort of from a country that had dual allegiance or somebody defected with one, you know where they took them all was to Area 51, to that mm. uh, to that place just on the edge of the big nuclear test range in Nevada mm. and called Dreamland and uh, Groom Lake. The, the, the lake bed there is Groom Lake. And so that's where they were all flying in the late 60s and early 70s, all of the MiGs and, and Sukhois and the other types of airplanes. And so that's all real. And so in my book, The Defector, that's where they take the MiG-25. But the real key to the plot is not that. The mm -hmm. real key to the plot is revealed later in the book, and that—that's the purpose of, of the story. And and uh, it, it and it's a super action-packed book as well. I'm really happy with it. And now I, I'm not giving you giving any details, but I'm I'm writing what happens next to my protagonist, to Kazimekis, and that's his awesome girlfriend, and to this cosmonaut Svetlana, and all the rest of it. So yeah, it's it's really fun writing thriller fiction. And um, two questions about this. Number one, are you involved in the process of helping develop this uh, television show with the Balboa Production Company? Are you involved in any way, or uh, I'm an executive more like a producer. consultant? Yeah, I'm an executive producer, and I'm their oh, wow. I'm their ultimate consultant. Cause, sure, because I did all the research and wrote the book, and I've and, I, and in life I was a combat fighter pilot, test pilot, astronaut, spaceship, <laughs> you know, pilot, spaceship commander. So, so, and I've done that before too. Uh, when Sean Penn was making the series, uh, uh, the first, which was like the first crew going to Mars, mm -hmm. um, he called me out of the blue. He said he'd read one of my books and asked me if I'd come down and advise him on how to be convincing as an astronaut. So I've been on set uh, filming for a series before, Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's kind of a double-edged sword because you're hired there to be a, a consultant and to give them good expert advice, but they don't have to follow it. And, and, and you don't really want your name affiliated with something that then you're embarrassed about or, or like, oh man, they just, that could never have happened. So, but, but the people that I'm working with, uh, uh, yeah, I'm pretty selective and I'm, and and Sly and his wife Jennifer, they love the Apollo murders. Really mm. like the book, and and so That's that awesome. motivates them. And I like I like the production team. So uh, so hopefully, and they're motivated to make something that's really good as well. So so, but we'll see. You know, and it takes time. It'll be of you know, course in the order uh, of I've years. I've been in that year. business my whole life. I know yeah, exactly it takes, what that's takes like. Takes time, and you never know for sure. It may yeah. it may never get made. But uh, but if you don't start, you'll never finish. Yeah yeah. Um, how that. I feel like there's so many uh, like other questions I have in my head, but the 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 have you seen um, the Apple Plus series? Everybody tells me it's the greatest sci-fi they've ever seen. Um, about like the first missions um, to the moon. Of I don't know which one. So there was one called From the Earth to the Moon, which was a series uh, that no, Tom I don't Hank think produced. it's that one. And then there's this new one called. Uh, for all mankind, that one, and then that there's one. the expanse. Um, yeah, for all mankind. Um, uh, have you seen the movie critiques that I've done online, like with Vanity Fair and those folks? I have not. I have not. Yeah. So they asked me to to pick apart TV shows and movies, or to mm. crit, or to compliment them if they're sure. good. And I started watching For All Mankind, and my wife and I started watching it because you know we've been in the business and we know the all this stuff, and. 
for like the first four or five episodes, I thought, hey, I'm really enjoying this. And then mm. it's like they got new writers or new directors or something. And suddenly it became, and nothing was credible anymore. Astronauts mm. stopped behaving like astronauts. And it was just kind of like, what, what happened? What, what's going on? And so maybe it's just because I'm biased because I'm, I'm, I know what's going on, but, it, but I just, I had to stop watching it because it, it, you know, it's like watching Armageddon, you know, it's right. like, <laughs> break. You know, it's just so stupid, you know, everything they're saying, I'm just like, what? Uh. And, and so uh, once it gets to that stage, you know, you're just kind of like, oh, well, it's just a cartoon and, and I don't get mad at Rocky and Bullwinkle. So I shouldn't get mad at this show either, but, but it's just silly. I'm going to take a swing for the fences here and I'm going to guess because even though I know I'm a little bit younger than you, like we're pretty much fairly close in there. I think, did you ever watch a movie with Joaquin Phoenix uh, when you were a young man called space camp? I've heard of it. I've never oh, watched. Space never camp. Watched yeah. it. I've heard of it. I think you would have liked that. At that formative, age, not now. Formative in a lot of people's uh, lives. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've watched a bunch of movies and, and it's great because what inspired me was TV right. shows and movies. Right. You know, Star Trek. But in Star Trek, they worked really hard to make it as credible as they could. Gene Roddenberry, I mean, the detail of how that ship worked, and they mm. really thought about it hard. And yeah, sure, it had to do stuff that you can't do, but they, you know, there's all these manuals and everything that were written about how that all could have been credible. So so to me, that was important. I, you know, I, I don't want it just to be silly. I, I want it to be exciting and thought provoking and inspirational, but mm. also close enough to reality that it might actually happen. Mm. And, uh, and that's what inspires my writing, I think as well. Uh, but also without those comic books and the science fiction books, and then Star Trek and 2001, a space odyssey and all that, and David Bowie playing space oddity without all of those other influences, I probably never would have imagined or even known about this this option in life so the artistic side is really important the inspirational side and pushing the boundaries and sh if a, if a movie's like you know not even close then you know okay fine it's just it's just a movie um yeah. and, and just get over it but uh but to me having the artistic imagination of just what might be that's a really important part of then creating the reality that flows in behind it because one thing that I have to ask, because I also write, I've written professionally, have had some stuff published, I've worked on television shows. And the thing about writing, it all always goes back to that sort of Hemingway anecdote, like writers, there's no such thing as writer's block. Writers write, that's what they do. Um, it takes a lot of discipline to write. What What's your process? Is it all this discipline that you've gained throughout the years doing all this incredibly intense stuff? That allows you to sit in a chair, weightless, at your keyboard to 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 spit out your prose. Or what's your process like? Do you devote X amount of hours a day to it, like by by law almost? <laughs> well, um, first off, uh, you got to decide why you're going to write. Mm. Like that's really important. What am I writing this for? What does victory look like? If I write this thing, this paragraph, this email, this. Uh, magazine article, this script, or this book. If I write it perfectly, why? What What is the end game? What am I trying to accomplish? Um, make sure that's clear in your head. You know, know why you're writing. You never have the the uh, tenacity to get it done if you don't know why you're writing it. If you're just doing it because it seems like fun today, you're never going to have the you know the, uh, the the staying power. So that's important. And then. Um, you have to find a way to free up enough of your life to make the time to do it. Or mm -hmm. it'll just be one of those things you always wanted to do, but you never did. Um, and so you need to reschedule your life because writing a book takes a lot of time, you know, and, and, uh, and for, in mind, because I write alternative history, historical fiction, thriller fiction, there's an enormous amount of research to get it all right. And also sure. When you're doing the research, that's when you discover a lot of the little cool things that could be in the story. And um, and so there's an enormous amount of research. And the next one I'm writing in the Apollo Murders series, I've been digging into heavily since last June. So I've been researching it and, and laying out all of the possibilities and digging up all the stories and doing a lot of reading. Um, so there's that piece. 
but then when it's time to write, um, I'm, I'm most creative when I'm not all distracted by, mm -hmm. you know, the, what's going on during the day. So I get up fairly early, exercise a little bit, you know, take the dog for a walk or go for a run or something, eat something reasonable, and then deal with the three or four things that truly have to get, you know, there's a fire burning every morning on something, you know, family <laughs> issues or business, because I help run several companies. And then, boom, I got to write. And I write until lunchtime or, you know, late lunch. Mm -hmm. And I need a free morning to write. If I try and write in the afternoon, my head's already too used up. You know, it's like trying to lift weights after a few hours. You're, you're just, you're tired. And so, um, so I write in the mornings and I give myself the goal of like a thousand words. If I can get a thousand words down and I write on a keyboard and I back at it constantly, like I, I don't just, you know, I, I, I constantly tinker with it as I go. Mm. Um, and one of the most uh, useful books I've read to learn mm. how to write was uh, the one that Stephen King wrote called On Writing. And it was good because he just sort of talked about the same thing I just did, why you write and then what his process is for writing. But mm. then he gave everybody a great gift. He put in some of his raw writing, like just just like a, a part of a chapter that he'd just written, hadn't gone back and edited, and his editor hadn't had a chance to go in and clean it up for him. And it was terrible. Like you could see there's a lot of cool ideas there, but it's like, oh, this is the, you know, you've used the same word three times and this is a run on sentence. And, right. and oh man, it, you know, you got to, but you have to get stuff down and get it going. And uh, oddly enough, if you got just a minute, when of I was course, on the spaceship, I got all the time in the world. When I was on the spaceship, um, one of the people that wanted to talk to me was Neil Young, the musician. Oh, and God, um, legend. And that was Canadian. Cool. So, so yeah, from Winnipeg. And so yeah. I'm talking to Neil Young and he, he told me two things that are really germane to what we're talking about. And number one, I was talking about songwriting because uh, I've written lots of songs. And of course, he's one of the best. Yeah, and yeah. Um, uh, Neil said two things. Number one, he said uh, he never in his life did he ever like write a song. He just wrote songs down. Like he waited until he had enough freedom of thought, uh, enough, you know, inspiration, the right muse struck him. And he just started writing the stuff all down. Mm. You know, it wasn't like he said, okay, today I'm going to write a hit song. That'll never work. Right. Just, you've got to give yourself the circumstances to have the mental freedom to be creative. And sure. then the second thing he said was don't judge what you're creating until you until it's done because if you're super judgmental about it then you'll you'll talk yourself into giving up you'll go oh yeah this song sucks which is oh, the easy way terrible. out right you almost want it you almost yeah. want to feel that way so right. you it's and like so, me with the you know it's like me with the solo flight it's exactly the same as you with the solo flight so you just have to get it written and then most of the songs that neil wrote aren't very good you know, he's written so many songs that you've never even heard songs. He never let anybody else hear because he sure. realized, OK, I let myself write it. But it turns out eh, not all that great a song. But then he wrote like three of his greatest songs in one day when he had the flu because he was just in the right frame of mind and sitting at home and wrote three great songs. Um, and uh, and so I think about that when I'm writing books. Number one, free myself up, get all the other distractions away, sit in a place like this where, you know, I, I've got, um, I don't have any other responsibilities and then just get writing and, and try and get yourself a thousand words down that day. And then the next day, go back when you sit down and read what you wrote yesterday and you're going to want to change some of it. Mm -hmm. And when you finally get, you know, whatever, 130,000 words written, 130 days worth of writing, um, you'll go, well, you know what? I didn't even need that whole section. It turns out it wasn't important for the story. And you need to have an editor, like, like a director needs a film editor. It's a different skill set. Come in and say, okay, hey, here's all the raw material. Now I'm going to cut this is a, a great bunch of stuff out of it. This is a great point. And this is like- Really important. As, some, as somebody who has written professionally and made a living off of it, my equivalent of the thousand words is 10 pages. I yeah. typically write in script format, right? So it's the 10 pages. Sure. Um, but what you just mentioned is such an interesting thing because in my world, typically your editor is your buddy and your, or, or people that you trust, right? That even though you trust them, they somehow are always trying to protect your feelings. Are you hiring somebody 
uh, and paying somebody objectively to be your editor or is, or is it somebody in your circle of trust? Um, well, my books are, are published by uh, big publishing houses. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a different publisher depending all the different countries that I'm published in. But uh, the original publisher that I signed with, which is Penguin Random House, mm. they suggested an editor. And, um, and she is terrific. Mm. She, she has edited every book that I've done. Wow. And, uh, and when, when we sat down and did the first one and she came back with her edit, I was like uh, affronted and pissed off and insulted. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I wrote all those words. Like, what are you doing changing all that? We don't know anything about flying F4s. How can you be changing my words? The F4 Phantom. Yeah. How can, you know, how can you be changing my words? Right. But then I'm like, okay, you know, get over myself and let's actually see what she's suggesting. And let's just get a clean version of what she wrote and read it and look at it from the reader's point of view, not my point of view. And I've learned that um, I need to trust her implicitly, but I always get the final say. And sometimes mm -hmm. she's wrong. I mean, she just got her opinion, you know, I sure. got my opinion. And so we have, but most of the time she's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and my, my first book, um, my first thriller, The Apollo Murders, it was the first fiction I'd written. So I wrote way too much. Mm. And uh, and she came in and said, hey, there's a huge amount of great stuff here, but we're going to, a lot of it doesn't tell the story. So we're just going to move it out. You don't need it. And we took 195,000 words and uh, the actual book is 135,000 words. Mm. So we cut 60,000 words that, you know, 60 days worth of writing we cut out of this book because it just, it didn't tell the story. Yeah. We didn't need it. And that's why you need an editor. You've got to have not, not, not your friend, not your enemy, but you need someone who is really skilled and who understands what success looks like and who can uh, work with you in order to make the best book possible. Every, every good writer has a good editor. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. And, and not advice that you hear a lot, to be honest, because I've, yeah. I've spoken, I've had Alan Ball on the show. I've had Frederick Raphael, Academy Award winner. Um, and that's the first time I hear that one. You need somebody to check you. You know, well, that's I a mean, valuable tool. You're learning to fly and right. you need an instructor. And you need, I mean, you've got to build your own skill set. You've got to build your own confidence. But even when you've been flying for a thousand hours, you'll still want to occasionally go hire a super experienced instructor to come in and tell you what you're doing wrong or what sure. bad habits you've developed or how the technology's changed or whatever. And, and you know, uh, Isaiah Thomas or Michael Jordan, they were working with coaches through their whole career. Sure. I mean, you know, you need, even though you're the best in the world, you still need, uh, you need an editor to come in and help you be even better. And that that's, it's as true for writing as anything else. Well, Commander Hadfield, this has been an honor and a blessing and final question for all those kids that are out there and they raise their hand and they say, I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. What advice would you give those kids? Uh, three things, Mark. Number one, uh, it's a you only get one body. So take care of your own body. And that's mm -hmm. not that hard. You get to control every single thing that you eat. You put the food in your own mouth. So so think about what you eat. Don't go crazy about it, but you know, be, be thoughtful about what you eat and get a little exercise every day. And if you do that, then you can maintain your health for your whole life. So number one, take care of your own body. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, if you want to f operate complex spaceships and explore new worlds and do all those things, uh, it's really technical. And so you're going to need deep technical training, like at, mm -hmm. at least a master's degree out of university in a technical field. doesn't matter which one, medicine, science, you know, chemistry, physics, uh, whatever, um, engineering. Um, so healthy body, and then advanced technical training. And then the third thing, Mark, is mm. learn how to make decisions and stick with them. Mm. Most That's people, a one. lot of people never learn that in their whole life. And uh, it's, it's a really useful skill to have. And you, I think you should start small. And that is, uh, like it just became February a few days ago or whatever month, uh, you know, as you turn your calendar. And 
say, okay, this month, February, what do we got? 29 days this year. This month, I am going to, and give yourself something, make a decision about something you're going to change. Like, I don't know, I'm going to do a hundred pushups every day this month, mm -hmm. or I'm going to learn five words of Japanese every day this month. And just say, it's only for a month but I'm making a decision and I'm going to stick with my decision mm. by the end of the month, by in this case, 29th of February, if you actually stick with your decision, look in the mirror, you will, mm. if you've been doing pushups, you can see that, that you've changed who you are or look, start speaking the, you know, the five times 29, 145 Japanese words that you now know. And, uh, and use them and recognize you made a decision and then, you changed who you were. Mm. That uh, recognizing uh, the necessity to be able to make decisions, that's a really important part about being an astronaut, changing who you are deliberately and eventually learning to make decisions that have really high consequence. Being a combat fighter pilot or a test pilot or a firefighter or, a, or a, someone who runs businesses or a doctor or something like that. And if you put those three things together, healthy body, advanced technical education, and the ability to make decisions and stick with them, then you not only be a good astronaut, you'll, you'll be good at life. Mm, well, I asked for advice for kids, but I ended up getting advice for myself. So I really <laughs> appreciate that, Commander. This You're has welcome. been an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. The book is The Defector. Um, it's, uh, it's available at Amazon. Um, you got also the Apollo murders, which is, you know, potentially going to become a series and, uh, commander Hadfield's working on a new one. So if you want to catch up before the new one comes out, now is the time to go get it. Um, again, thank you so much. If you're ever in the Florida keys and, and I'm around, you know, I got boat boat in my dock right here behind the house. I got tanks ready to fill up with air and, uh, and maybe, uh, you can check me out on my solo uh, flight. <laughs> that sounds great. And bring a guitar plug to play one of those guitars behind you. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank All right. you, sir. Thank Take you, care, guys. Mark. Be well. Fly well. Yes. You, you too.